Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Explore Our Home, the Great Exhibition and Road Festival's online series of events. In this online series, we bring the best of art and science, nature and technology, innovation and creativity from across South Kensington directly into your homes. My name is Harry Jenkins, and I'm a master's student at Imperial College London, studying science communication. Today, we've got a great discussion lined up for you. In celebration of Earth Day, we're joined by an expert panel to explore how we can care for our local environments and form better connections with nature. But before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to remind everyone that today is an interactive discussion, and we'd love to hear your thoughts, comments, and questions throughout. Just write to us on the YouTube chat function, and your comments will be passed on to me and put to our speakers. As well as questions, it'd be great to hear of your own connections with nature and ways you make sure you get your fix of the natural world in your busy day to day lives. Please be considerate when posting in the chat. We'll be removing anything that disrupts the experience for others. Now, I'd like to introduce our speakers. First up, we have Dr. Rob Phillips, product designer and leader of the Citizen Nature Watch project at the Royal College of Art, empowering people to document their local wildlife through DIY nature cameras and other technologies. Next up, we have Harriet Fink, Learning Volunteering Program Manager for the Urban Nature Project at the Natural History Museum, transforming the museum's five-acre site in South Kensington into a welcoming, accessible, and biologically, biologically diverse green space in the heart of London. And last but not least, we have Taishan Hayden-Smith, founder of Grow to Know, a nonprofit focused on empowering young people through horticulture, whilst also creating a more inclusive environment. So to kick things off today, um, we're going to be discussing how the pandemic and the resulting lockdown has obviously made everyone more aware of local areas and the value of natural surroundings that people can access. I'm going to ask each of you, why do you think it's important that we connect with nature, both for ourselves and the environment? Harriet, shall we start with you? Sure. Hey. Um, it's great to join everyone today. Um, I think it's been really interesting how much uh, people have reconnected with with the importance for people's well-being of being outdoors um particularly in a time when it's been extra challenging um so that's physical and yeah walking being a really great form of exercise for for a lot of people and for our mental well-being really primarily um but there are other things that i think are important around that from uh the importance of public space that having low cost spaces where people can hang out and socialize or put on an event meet a group um and then yeah hopefully also really there is evidence that it links to people wanting to look after the environment more so for lots of reasons and yeah it's been interesting to see yeah definitely and Tation, i know <laughs> what you've been doing has been progress over the pandemic. I wonder if you could talk to about how Grow to Know has kind of worked alongside the issues that everyone else has been facing during the pandemic. Yeah, uh, um, some really important points from Harriet. Um, and just to extend on, on what Harriet's been saying, I think the pandemic's definitely highlighted, you know, some real um, issues within society and the way that we live and our relationship and our, the dynamic between our, our outdoor green spaces. I think people that, that, that unfortunately didn't have a lot of space during the pandemic and being encouraged to stay at home obviously found it a lot harder to to, to deal with um you know the pandemic and lockdown because they didn't have access to those outdoor green spaces um so when i set up grow to know in the late in late 2019 I, I wasn't to know that um you know what was to come and i just think that grow to knows um and, and the, the values and the concept um is all about providing access and, and giving more opportunity to more people uh, through horticultural outdoor spaces or nature. And I think that's such an important conversation to start having because uh, not everyone is fortunate enough to have a garden. Uh, not, not everyone is fortunate enough to have uh, massive amounts of um, outdoor space. And so we, I feel like we, there's, there's a, a duty for us to try and engage with those people that aren't able to um, you know, have the luxury of having a garden, for example, and, and find ways that we can get people outdoors uh, and bring people and unify people as a community. Thanks so much. And Rob, uh, obviously a, a part of your project has been, I mean, it's been very much getting people outdoors and interacting with nature. Do you think the pandemic's obviously made this more important to do? Yeah, I think um, there's a number of things. I think, first of all, people think that, well, people's perception is sometimes that nature is in the countryside. It's not. It's 
everywhere and it should remain um completely accessible to as many people possible i mean richard Lueve, um an infamous uh, infamous author says it's part of our human right which i would agree i think it is um and i think i think it's really important that you know we've spent a number of generations in this kind of uh, fight or flight mode digital um, digital processes have totally transformed our lives and i think i mean I think within this question, you know, there has been a lot of trauma within the pandemic. And I think this panel, we're not, um, we're fully aware of that. I know it's affected every every one of us. Um, but I think one one thing that it has uh, brought about is it's, it's made us reappraise what's important, how we're using our time, how we're use, doing things. So rather than commuting, I've seen colleagues go for walks, um, for nature walks. I've seen colleague, colleagues ask me to recommend um, field study guides, like they're little, they're quite sort of straightforward things, so you can go and spot and see what they are. Um, and I think it's it's changed our connectivity to to our natural world. I, I don't think it's I don't think it's it's just as simple. I know you know the easiest way. How do we explore the natural world? Just go outside and have a look at it. Um, you don't necessarily need any equipment to to do that. Um, you really don't. Um, I know the My Nature Watch project is a is you know a piece of equipment with it, but you don't need to. You just need to take the time. Uh, you know, a magnifying glass enhances that experience. Um, great, it, but it doesn't have to be the be all and end all. And I think that's something that's really important um, to kind of understand is that the barriers to entry um they're different for everybody in different places um and some people won't have a raincoat some people won't have a jacket some people won't have binoculars that's fine but it, it doesn't just just start um by engaging in your natural world because as soon as you start to engage then you care about it amazing yeah definitely and we've actually had a question uh, from an audience member which relates to so you're talking about how people asking have been asking you about how to explore nature and I think part of that's also how to help protect nature now people are realizing how important that is. Uh, so Joanne's asked, how can I help some of the species of animals that are listed as endangered or threatened or their numbers are declining in this country? Rob, is there anything you could speak to that? Yeah, sure. I think um, so. This is a massive challenge. And I, I laugh because it's kind of like there's no silver bullet for how you solve this. It's, this is huge. Um, so my suggestion is um, what can you yourself start to do? So, for example, it could be that you start to um, volunteer with your local um, wildlife trust. There are a number based all over the country and there might be independent links to those. Um, then how can you help the the school or organization or institution achieve something so again through the world wildlife trust there's something called 30 days wild that's coming up it's a um it's a campaign that runs through the whole month of june check it out and start to look at um interventions that can see i think the problem is is that this is a really wicked problem and it's really arrogant of kind of designers to go we can solve it just by doing this because we can't um i think we need to review what do we use how do we use it what's our behavior what are we prepared to change i mean and the bigger questions at hand you know in 50 years will we even be eating meat maybe not will we even be using leather probably not um so sometimes these things and, and the pandemic has taken us through a, a massive shift um and i think yeah that that's 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 a challenge that is kind of for all so the the context is wider than just going this is the solution i think as if you talk to any of my students it's all about context and designing for what's appropriate um but reach out to your local communities i know um Taishan has some amazing ways of uh, cultivating communities within within those means it's pretty impressive amazing yeah thank you yeah it is a really big problem obviously isn't it but there are definitely a new goal um harriet you want to speak to us yeah i guess there's there are like specific 
creatures that you can do specific things for if you've got space that you can influence or yeah people you can lobby to to influence in in public spaces so stag beetles and leaving dead wood i'm particularly excited for stag beetles because london is one of their last kind of stronghold outposts which i think is exciting for an endangered species to choose london as one of its last uh, strongholds um uh, in general, like there are so many creatures that we're losing at such a rapid rate that just providing biodiverse spaces, it shores up the system a bit. So if you're looking at like the decline of sparrows that are on endangered lists, then yeah, ensuring that you're not putting pesticides, that you've got messy areas, that you're leaving things till spring has finally come before you're de deadheading and that you're yeah, allowing a good insect population that supports the bird population. So in a way it sort of is the build a space and they will come and yeah you don't you will shore up a system in general and then there is also i think we'll come on to in maybe more depth but looking at the idea of studying and uh surveying what's there or using some of the noticing to to feed science projects and provide some of those those databases and base signs that people can see what is working what's not working where to put effort um, and yeah, where the problems are. Yeah, amazing. Thank you for that. Um, and some of the things we were talking about earlier was definitely about how, like we were saying, the importance of nature being kind of highlighted through the pandemic and how it's kind of brought to light as well, who is able to access nature. Um, so how, what would be kind of your opinions on how do we address and kind of counter these disparities in access to nature and green spaces? Tayshan, do you want to kind of talk about that? Because I know obviously Groton is a big part, and this is a big part of what they're trying to achieve. Yeah, I mean, I can speak through my own experience. And, you know, when I, when I first got into a garden, it, I'd say, well, obviously I've been inspired by nature all my life. And I think I had a very holistic upbringing um, from my mum. But I think when, when, it, when it became a conscious thought, oh, gardening, and, and before 2017, I didn't even know what the word horticulture meant. And I think that's not by accident. Um, not, not to say, I, I think if you don't have um, like a, a parent or a role model in your life that, that brings you into that world, then it's quite hard to, to enter that, especially, you know, for someone from my community where kind of life is, is kind of at 100 miles an hour uh, and people are, 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 are struggling. Um, and, you know, horticulture, gardening, nature isn't the first thing on your mind. It's trying to put food on your, your, your kid's plate or, you know, trying to, to survive. Uh, and I think actually that these things can go hand in hand. Um, and so I, I think one of one of the things that I'm aiming to do is create a perception around horticulture being more of a necessity, uh, more of a foundation to our education and the way that we live rather than a luxury. Um, you know, I think especially this borough that, that I live in, obviously, you know, there's South Ken and North Ken, and there's actually, it's very polarized in the way that uh, both sides of the borough are. Um, obviously with a lack of space in North Ken uh, with, you know, Quite a lot of council housing, uh, a lot of blocks and estates. Um, and, but in in South Ken, on the contrary, there's kind of private gardens um, for you know minimal numbers of, of people that live there. Um, and so actually, I think we th there does need to be a shift in the way that we see uh, kind of public spaces and and, and residential areas where uh, you know people in twenty story tower blocks who don't have a, their own garden. Actually, we, we need to engage with those people and try to uh, bring to bring them together um, to, to give them more access to outdoor spaces and uh, you know the the understanding that actually horticulture is something that can uh, not only you know benefit your mental health but can provide solutions to food security issues and promoting biodiversity so the environment um, and for me it's just something I'm really passionate about bringing into the hands of uh, you know people that otherwise haven't really engaged with it. Amazing, thanks so much. And we've got some photos from your project here. Um, if there's anything you want to kind of discuss about what we're seeing. Yeah, so there's actually a picture of what it will, what it looked like before. And I think it's, there's kind of like a, uh, not there's, it, I think it's me breaking in the, in, in the soil, um, but it was a space. So the way that Grow to Know started, and, and I say Grow to Know, but it wasn't really Grow to Know at the time. It was just uh, me, myself, my family, and uh, community mem members coming together. Um, and so I live just beneath the Grenfell Tower uh, block. And um, 
myself, my family, my community, um, you know, experienced the, the fire and lost people and community in that. And uh, myself, my missus and, and my, my son at the time, um, we were doing artwork in the community in Maxilla, and uh, a place called Maxilla, and artwork wasn't really doing much for us. Um, and for some reason, we, we stumbled into this green space. I call it a green space, but it was kind of, um, kind of like a barren, um, dry, waste space it wasn't something that had been cared for uh, and we just injected some love into it um, and so what you saw before there was those that, that picture there um, you see that's the after um, and actually it's, it's developed a lot since then but what, what we found was actually being in that space um, and, and uh, I mean I, I got named the, the Grenfell Gorilla Gardener but I didn't know what gorilla gardening was at the time I thought someone was literally calling me a gorilla and took offense to it um, but quickly found out that they were actually just complimenting what we were doing. Um, and yeah, it, I, I, we, we transformed that space um, and kind of utilized what was available to us. So it wasn't a project. There was no way of accessing resources through a structured company or nonprofit. Um, I was 20 at the time and didn't really have any clue about any of that. Um, and yeah, it was just a very organic process. And be, by being present in that space, you'd find people that walk past and shared a smile, um, shared a conversation. Um, and, and offered their time um, to, 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 to get involved. And uh, it was such a, um, it, what, what that garden did was it pulled down barriers. And, and I met so many amazing, uh, inspiring people along that way, along that journey. And uh, that then inspired me to, 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 to make a change and, and set up something that can give more access and more opportunity. Because like I mentioned before, by being in that garden, um, I, I almost felt a bit embarrassed, a bit ashamed. And, and people typically know me as a footballer. Um, and so it's, it, it must have been a bit weird, weird for my boys to see me in the, in the garden with a, you know, a shovel in my hand. Um, but, but it made me ask questions of myself and why do I feel that way? And why, why is there that perception that I shouldn't be a gardener? Or why, why do I feel uncomfortable in this space? And it, yeah, and it made me really think, okay, well, there are certain things that I think that do need to change. And uh, it's something that I'm passionate about being a part of. Amazing. And Harriet, do you know the Yeah, I think. Some, I mean, so much really interesting stuff in what Taishan says, but the um, three things I wanted to pick out from that. The one um, about, like, I think as a sector, the kind of environment sector, often it, historically has really sort of looked down on food growing as something separate and kind of it hasn't involved it as part of the environment movement or part of green spaces. And it can be quite sort of compartmentalised or or like doesn't recognize the range of different ways people connect to nature. So taking photos or yeah, hanging out and having a barbecue or playing sport. And I think it's, I think it's starting to change, but I think that's also quite an important way for diversifying and yeah, recognizing the ways people are already engaged and building on those or providing more biodiversity on the side of football pitches or um, the, the other thing um, that struck me while Jason was talking was there are so many people that's, start doing similar things or uh rarely build them up as much as Tayshan has but but start by doing projects and sort of growing or starting something on their estate and then to actually get those long-term supported or recognized or actually made possible and encouraged also feels like there's a job to do so many kind of community gardens are really struggling on the margins for funding and do such brilliant work and then yeah, struggle to sustain that work or sustain the people who are doing that work. And so I think there's also a piece for people to recognise the role that they're playing more in society and for the, uh, the funding system to catch up on that. Um, and yeah, I've forgotten what the third thing was, of course, but there was. <laughs> Amazing, that's great, thank you. Sorry, the other thing was about representation as well for, for not seeing people like yourselves. And actually, there are some fantastic people who've been working in this area for decades and don't get the, the prominence and the, the showcase. I'm thinking of May Project Gardens, uh, run by a guy called Ian Solomon Kowal, that just they've, yeah, he's done like Kickstarter to raise funds himself. And he does fantastic things. I've often heard him talk about as like, a showcase example and he's another one that's on the margins and that maybe isn't as well known as he should be yeah so. 
amazing, thank you. Um, I've got a question from the audience here, from MyB. What's the best way or tools to document trees on maps for monitoring? Rob, um, I don't know if you might be able to talk to this one. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, part of part of my work is looking at that the other end of the scale of not just establishing groups and communities, but really how we start to measure, monitor and impact. Uh, imagine their success um, over a course of time and really leverage technologies to kind of um, start to understand how you can make um, a community effort to, to document material towards um, scientific practice. Um, so if you look at there's quite an interesting group called SciStarter and um, you'll find so citizen science is basically the same way that you would um, volunteer your time. You um, you you volunteer essentially the activities the, of what you're doing. So the simplest way to think about it is, um, you know, one in a physical means, um, the uh, Citizen Shepherds project. So it, it works on the South Downs just around the corner from me. And while people go for, for a walk, they take a particular route and they check in um, on the sheep. Um, in the nearby fields and they just see what has happening. They don't um, need necessarily any skills to be able to do that. They get a bit of training and it's just people with a telephone. Um, so it's really, really straightforward. Then you get more um, technologically advanced um, systems. So for example, on SciStarter, you'll see um, you know, mobile phone apps all the way through to um, DIY technologies that you can make yourselves, um, which is where the My Nature Watch project uh, comes in. So yeah, check, check those out. I think it's, there are literally in the last, probably four to five years, um, citizen science activities have been pretty exponential. They've been around for a long time. Um, but I think as technologies increase, the rigors increase, um, people, if you even look at our own time, how much free time people have, even in the last 50 years, has totally changed. Um, why? Because we've had technological interventions um, you know, we we no longer have to wash clothes by hand. We use washing. Most people use a washing machine or communal washing machine. I.e., we have more time. Um, so that's where citizen science is a really interesting advocate, and it's also um, internationally, it's really kind of like pushing back against government policy because it's enabling and giving people the agency to go. This is actually what our air quality. Um, is like this is how it's working this is the evidence of what we've captured and i'm afraid you know so governments are starting to to change that perception so i think you know within that natural world there is um there's a big tension that i think is really interesting um as a designer it's a really exciting time to be to be engaged in in the world and i think um Traditionally, we've always people have always been scared of governments, whereas actually everything's changing the balance quite a lot. Um, Green New Deal, so many, so many different things that are coming together. Um, and I think there's, yeah, there's a lot there. There's a lot there. Yeah, definitely amazing. And I'm really glad you brought up citizen science as well, because obviously a lot of the work you do with Nature Watch is a uh, form of citizen science. And I know we've got some photos here if you want to kind of chat through some of it. Um, and I think it'd be quite interesting for you to discuss how, because obviously you're at the Royal College of Art, maybe a lot of people might not necessarily associate uh, that organisation to do with science, and maybe that sort of dynamic would be quite interesting to explore. Yeah, absolutely. So um, there are a couple of links that some of your colleagues will share um, uh, on the page as we go. So the My Nature Watch project is um, is a collaborative venture um, put together by the Goldsmiths Interaction Research Studio um, and um, the Royal College of Art the Design Products Programme, which I tutor on. So here what you'll see is these kind of collection of food packaging tubs gaffer taped around some sticks. Um, what they are is it's a, it's a pretty straightforward um, process. We're using a Raspberry Pi Uno. Um, all of the plans and details and parts you can buy off the shelf they're pretty cheap 
um, traditionally a trail camera. So basically it's a, it's a working camera, something walks past it, it takes an image, uh, it takes a photograph. Um, traditionally trail cameras, a, a bad one is about 80 pounds. Um, a really, really good one is about 300 pounds. Um, the, the kit that's been designed costs about 35 quid um, and the parts can be repaired can be tailored can be changed we've been working with groups up and down the country um, we've been working with schools charities even um, the white stork project and the nep estate this was a workshop that we ran um, with the national trust and the product is really those families working together that then went to invest, in, investigate their natural world. Um, so the kits you can put together on your kitchen table. It doesn't take um, doesn't take any tools or any sort of special know how. It's pretty straightforward. The kits are kind of plug and play. Um, and I suppose you can check out our social social media feed for what people have captured because they've been pretty amazing. Um, this was one project where. Um, someone uh, uh, in Suffolk, the Suffolk, Suffolk Wildlife Trust, they were reintroducing and looking at how they could monitor um, hedgehogs in their um, hedgehog hospital. And it actually led to them presenting what they were doing um, within the Houses of Parliament, which was really interesting because they were going, well, we've got the evidence of how quickly our hedgehogs um, are, are recovering. Um, and so this tiny, tiny bit of evidence, again, changed how they could have quite dynamic conversations. So I think um, it's it's quite in, it's quite easy to be dismissive of community led projects. I think it is um, in in a kind of um, from a top down. You know, how is a company? How is a big organisation going to do things? I think the reverse. I think community led projects can catalyse complete change um, because they're embedded within our society. I mean, so within this piece of work, then my Nature Watch project, we we were um, we were on BBC Spring Watch a couple of years ago. Um, We've then worked with the Design Museum and our colleagues on this chat can share a, a couple of the films of the links um, that you can you can check out later. And again, um, it's just www.mynaturewatch.net um, is where all the instructions and things are. But we've had amazing um, anecdotes. And if I've got one second um, to share one. OK, so this was this was. Um, the Sussex Wildlife Trust capturing water voles and so they'd ad adapted kind of our cameras so that they could um, run through the tubes. Um, one um, one individual, uh, just a short, and again it is an anecdote, um, they, they asked for a camera, a kit, so we sent them one. Um, they deployed it in their garden and they, they phoned me up about a week later and went, Rob, it's, it's not working. It's not working and we're like right okay do you mind if we come and have a visit and see what's happening so anyway so we popped around and um this garden was a barren island with nothing in it and paving slabs everywhere and again i don't mean to say that as derogatory that's not dismissive um it's just what people had it's just what they knew um and um, the the individual expected they would get snow leopards because they've got a, a trail camera. So they would see things. And I was like, well, I'm terribly sorry, but, you know, snow leopards don't really live in East Croydon. Um, <laughs> not really. And anyway, so we went through it and, and we just went, look, there's no wildlife in your garden, like none. And um, now, a year later, from the intervention of having camera kits and, and working with us, um, they they've got loads why because they started to do something that was really simple which is they cut a hedgehog hole um in in their fence and so hedgehogs could come in and out now this sort of uh, father and son duo the the five-year-old son then basically uh, went to all his neighbors and went oh my dad can cut a hole in your fence and before he knew it this this dad who was like rob i didn't sign up for this had sort of catalyzed this hedgehog super highway um going through this street so for me those are the impacts the really interesting impacts of projects like these is 
you know, as, as Harriet was saying, the biggest challenge with these types of things is that they're funded for a certain period of time and then they disappear. Um, they're not necessarily funded for entirety. So how you're catalyzing change um, to be funded over a number of months and years is, is through communities um, and resourcing and doing that um, with great care because we need to now design for exit. So as in, how do you create a project? Then as soon as you start creating that project, how do you leave that project so that you're also being responsible for not leaving that community in a, in a worse position than when you turned up? And so these ethical issues are, are critical um, and it's a wider conversation than we can have today. But it's an interesting time. Thank you, Harry. Amazing. Yeah, I mean, it's a fantastic project. Um, we've actually got another question from the audience, which I think your time to shine, Harriet, from Russell. Are any of you involved or going to be with the Natural History Museum's Urban Nature Project? If so, with what type of activities and initial results? Yeah, that's my remit. Um, so I am a part of the Urban Nature Project team. Um, and so my remit within that is uh, the learning and activities learning volunteering activities that will happen on the site at the Natural History Museum. So the gardens um, as a whole are going to be changed um, and they will open in their new form in 2023, late 23 or summer 23, rather is the plan. Um, so you've got on your screen an image of what's currently the Darwin Courtyard, which is a paved kind of sort of amphitheater like set of steps outside at the back of the museum and this space within the new gardens will be looking at how uh, nature can be encouraged back by pulling up some of the paving stones by doing some light touch planting and some tree planting um and then the wildlife garden we've currently got is really beautiful it will be expanded a bit the pond needs redoing and then we're going to have where currently a civic lawn will be changed to um, show the story of life um, as it evolved on Earth. So it's uh, it, the whole gardens is looking at change on a geological time frame and change on a human time frame and what we can do in cities to encourage nature and to make positive change. Um, it also will be a science study site. We're super lucky to have 300 scientists working in the building that the garden is outside of. Um, and so many of those are specialists in insects, birds, plants. And so they will be uh, studying what's happening in the garden, first with the move of it and how to translocate and how to uh, do yeah, well. Uh, positive change for biodiversity and then looking at how the management of the garden works and what you can do what species get attracted how you can yeah uh, manage the space best for biodiversity in the city um it will be a study site there's a number of other study sites that the project is involved with nationally um for yeah looking at a more uh, uk level what's happening with nature in cities and how to engage people there's a really exciting um, national learning programme that will be for upper key stage two and key stage three um, young people that will be getting them to ask science questions. And then um, it will be a competition for one of those to be turned into a citizen science project to be studied. Um, and then, yeah, so I'm looking at what can happen on site. I'm looking at how we can make our family programme uh, interactive and uh, attractive to people who don't tend to come visit us as much we uh, yeah how do we get black and ethnically diverse audiences um, in the representative numbers of their populations in our local area how do we tell diverse stories um, and how can our volunteer program support people to take sort of first steps in confidence and first steps to developing uh, work readiness or yeah get well-being benefits from volunteering rather than being graduates who want jobs and should be already being paid to have those jobs um, we will have apprenticeship positions and um, youth worker training and youth advisory panels and um, yeah we're doing some co-curated projects so I'm actually working with Taishan and Grow to Know to, to look at um, 
co-curating one of the installations on site and um, to get yeah, a narrative of what audiences, how they work with plants or how they're, how they're interested in plants. So yes, lots of things. Initial results, we've been working on talking with audiences about what they want. So that's a lot of what our initial results are at the moment is what do people want from us? And um, the science stuff is in the early days, looking at which species are important and how can we encourage uh, smaller groups that don't have 300 scientists on their doorstep to also monitor their spaces. Um, so yeah, that's kind of in the early stages and not quite ready yet. They're also doing really exciting things where um, you can take a petal and put it in a small thing that plugs in through USB into your computer and it tells you the DNA of everything that's touched that petal. You can do the same with a little bit of water. It'll tell you everything that's touched that water um, and soil. Um, so yeah, they're doing exciting things on working out actually then how to make sense of that data and share that data and how to make that something that other people can do. So early days, but exciting and yeah, lots of different things. Gosh, yeah, amazing. So much interesting stuff going on there all in one thing. Um, excited to see how it all develops. Um, we're getting some, we're having some great questions from the audience and getting some great discussion out of it. We've got another one from D asking, how do I make a barren street around my flat in Harrow green by convincing the council to grow more trees? Similarly with the management company of our flats on planting more shrubs, thin trees in the little garden space at the entrance of our communal block of flats. Taishan, you, would, you, would you like to try and answer this one? Yeah, this is obviously something I'm really passionate about coming from inner city London. You know, I'm very familiar with the kind of the greys and the, the brick, the concrete um, that is London. And I think, I think the most important thing to do is organize and then strategize kind of if, if you have neighbors, if you've got a community, maybe sp spread the word, have those conversations, start speaking to your counselors um, and just kind of gather that support um, to then take to, um, you know, your counselors who can then take it to um, and then you can put together petitions. I think it's all about just campaigning for what you believe um, you need. I mean, I, I just believe that it's, so important that we, we're greening up our great gray spaces in, in our communities, not only uh, to benefit our, our mental health, but aesthetically, I think it's just such a nicer place to, to be. Uh, and I, I just think that, um, yeah, there's so many different solutions out there that it's just a matter of uh, organizing and um, gathering that support to, to, to implement those changes. Great, thank you. Um... And I think we'll keep on carrying the theme of audience questions for now before we get into the wider discussions. We have a question from Charlotte. I think that a lot of the outside activities, such as sport, gardening, and walking, is less fun in winter. Do any of you have any tips on how to keep up with the momentum started in the spring slash summer and preventing drop off in, in engagement? Um, Rob, you want to go for that? Yeah, there's some. Um... That's a challenge. I think the, <laughs> it's, it's plain and simple. I mean, especially in, you know, in the UK, weather is not always our ally. I think I've worked with a, with a number of projects and groups and sometimes spaces are not considered, they're not designed, they're not fit for purpose. So they don't have um, warm locations. I think how you're doing things is sometimes if you can either link people internationally so sometimes you know there's some there's some pretty amazing projects there's one in barcelona called the smart citizens project it's run by the the makerspace there um and part of eap um and what they do is they believe that by having smart citizens um and it's a technology kit anyone can can use it by having smart citizens you can then have a smart city and so they in some respects they've got a similar climate to ours um so you can collaborate, especially now in the digital age, internationally to help somebody else at different times of the year. Um, but I think you're always going to get um, a number of challenges uh, within those. I think it's also it's how we talk about those openly, um, because, you know, when we've been doing the nature watch project um some people we were giving kits, they were like, oh, I really want to see badgers early in the morning, but I don't have a hat or a scarf or a coat to 
stay warm at 4 a.m and i was like right okay so that's what we need to be funding within our project um and so i think you know really try and understand what you're trying to achieve um and sometimes is exactly what taishan's saying is that people have amazing skill sets sometimes it's just about linking those people together and going look you've got the resources and knowledge for this but how can you help that but you can't get outside but you might have the tools i mean it's a bit like um you know there are now some interesting sharing libraries that are sharing tools and tools and equipments um so you don't even have to buy it you know and it's reducing that that barrier to entry so you don't need a shed um you can just essentially rent a spade for a quid a day um and i think it is very easy to say just go and do it um but i think sometimes it, it does take that first step of like right come on how are we going to so i think it is it is a challenge i know that people are going to share contacts i think again um to the question i don't know the full context of of, of kind of like the location you're designing and working in, but i would really encourage you to to seek how you can collaborate with other climates and other locations could be one way around it harriet yeah, I um I like those ideas. I also um I when I was working before we I used to manage a space that did um after school play in a, a forest and a, a small small garden space, small forest wood probably more accurate. And um we yeah, for the winter the kind of we da went down the approach of trying to make it season specific and look for what actually was the good thing. So in that context we it got dark earlier so we could play games around the dark and uh yeah kind of some they used to love kind of scary sort of playing with that kind of thing or look at talking about night creatures and how creatures adapted to the night you can look at yeah birds and how people how creatures survive the winter and yeah feeding birds and kind of looking at the specifics of the season as something you know it's also about yeah the framing of how you get people interested in stuff and I guess also with nature reserves, actually, winter's the really busy time for when there's a lot to do and you can do pruning and some of the the things that are also quite active things. So keeping active, because I think that, yeah, it's really important also not to push people past their, their needs being met, particularly if you're wanting to make it attractive to wider audiences. You need to have hot chocolate, tea, warm drink breaks. You need to, yeah, have a bank of appropriate clothing that they can borrow or yeah spaces where you can recommend they can get it cheaply and yeah breaks fires if you are able to also exciting kind of winter linking back to yeah what we get from nature how things work together yeah wonderful so lots of great suggestions here um and i think touching on this theme and i think something i know all of you kind of quite passionate about um it kind of been reported that children are spending kind of a lot less time outside than they used in the previous decade. I wonder kind of if you could talk touch on why you think outdoor experiences are so important for young people and actually getting them involved in nature. Peichan, do you want to start with this one? Yeah, um, I think there's, and definitely, you know, from the people that I know and growing up, there wasn't that much of an access point for nature or horticulture consciously. I mean, I, I was always influenced because I played football in the park and I spent probably 80% of my time out in a park kicking a ball in the bush or climbing a tree trying to get the ball, whatever it might have been. But yeah. unfortunately, a lot of young people don't get that opportunity to, to consciously be in nature and really embrace it. Um, and I do think there, there needs to be a real push to, to, to have it, you know, as part of the school curriculum, um, you know, as something that we, we learn growing up, you know, whether that be allotment spaces or, you know, understanding about biodiversity and um, how we can tackle the food security issues in, in, in our own communities, blue green roofs. I mean, there's so many different solutions and, you know, linking into the last question, uh, you know, especially in winter, like, as, a, like as, a, as a young person, you know, when I was younger, I never wanted to be out in the cold, wet, rainy winter. But I just think that we can not replace, but um, kind of optimize the experience through technology. Um, so one thing that I'm really keen on doing is doing consultation and co-design 
um, projects with communities, schools, um, and residential areas where we uh, actually the beneficiaries of a space are um, you know influence and participate in the design aspects and that all can be done indoors so whilst you're not you know bringing them outdoors necessarily but there's so many different ways we can raise awareness and upskill and uh, uh, improve the knowledge of communities around um, community spaces outdoor spaces uh, nature inspired projects um, through technology that could be through virtual reality so that's something I'm really keen on uh, on engaging with because I think young people you know almost as if it's a game um, imagine being able to just play around with a space by putting on some goggles um, and I think you know, looking at the, uh, the innovative ways we can engage with people through technology is, is something I'm really keen to explore um, so I think yeah linking it back to the other question that you asked I think going into winter in the colder months where people aren't too keen to get outdoors you can actually do loads of things indoors that sets you up and gets you ready to go outdoors into spring, summer, um, and, and just, I think it all can be very exciting. Yeah, amazing. And I feel like you touched on a lot of things. I think a lot of people consider, I guess, the, the classic ways of engaging with nature, like horticulture, animal watching, going for nature walks, as maybe hobbies for the older generation. Um, and like you were saying with like VR, I think it's like really important that we innovate either through design or science. Um, the way we actually talk about and interact with nature. And obviously a lot of the work that all three of you are doing kind of relates to this. Um, and I think it really interesting to hear, Rob, what you think design, how that actually comes into this sort of innovation when it comes to interacting with nature. Yeah, sure. I mean, there's, um, there's quite, there's extensive research in how to, um, how design can leverage um, people's engagement with the natural world. Um, I've put some of it in a, in a link I think one of your colleagues can share, um, mainly because I cite a lot of other people. So there's an amazing um, research group in Derby University that's looking at um, nature connectivity. Um, uh, Dr. Miles Richardson. Um, they're doing some pretty amazing stuff. I mean, what nature really teaches us is it builds our confidence it lets us understand risk especially from a from a from a child's perspective it also sort of brings together our um our links health and well-being but but also like i find it crazy i find it absolutely insane that you walk into a supermarket and you can buy a punnet of blackberries right like that and and they're like four pounds and i'm like and and people are just go okay yeah I'll take three and you're like right and I'm very lucky because I live in a in a place where there are just just above the sort of the road where all the dogs walk and like there's a really good bank of blackberries and so you know if I talk to my four year old daughter one of her favourite things in the summer and and towards September is to go out blackberry picking get a bundle of them eat them and we just it's just going for a walk it's kind of heaven. Um, of course, you have to be be aware not to not to poison yourself, and you have to leave it leave enough um, for other people and for for animals and 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 other species to be able to benefit from that. But I think design has a has a lot to do. I mean, if you, I believe design is an appropriate tool, an appropriate mechanism. I mean, I share quite a lot of it in um, in my book, um, Future Kind. Um, and I think, you know, I think a colleague of mine, John Thackeray, he said previously, and I really like this quote, he was like, previously we've been in the age of oil. Um, now we are in the age of soil, um, which I really, I really agree with, you know, how we're looking at things in a completely different way. I'm, I'm an allotment holder, have been for about 15, 20 years. Um, and I'm really seriously and changing my allotment to no dig. Why? Because it's better for the soil quality. Um, Charles Dowding, um, an amazing um, advocate of these things. If five years ago, I'd be like, what? You're not going to, what? It's like revolutionary. If you talk to people around you, you're not digging your, and so I think sometimes it's about also not just what design can do, but what we can do in kind of being open to going okay just because our grandparents did that do we need to what should we be doing and there are amazing so like new nature is um a magazine um it's run by um 
it's run by youth advocates youth editorial team and it's brilliant um because it's all written by 16 to 22 year olds and it's amazing absolutely amazing because yeah, I don't know, I see my role as kind of how we can leave things in a better state and how I can help young people. Um, because we're custodians of this world the same way that we're custodians of um, of materials and products that we buy. Um, you know, at some point they have an end of life. So where we're looking at sustainability, it's really about how we're custodians of the natural world too. Wonderful, thank you. And we've got a few more questions now from the audience. We have a question from Hon Lee asking, any known more larger societies that relate to this type of community work with connecting nature? Uh, Harriet, do you have anything you'd like to say to that one? Um, I haven't got a lot of them at the tip of my tongue, but there are. And I, um, so there is the, the what used to be the Farm and Gardens Association, um, that's, and particularly has a really good uh, base in London um, so that's I think they've changed to farm and garden um, there's a London environmental educators forum um, and yeah I'm thinking of you know Hammersmith and has a community garden association for, for their area but so yeah I can't think of more but there definitely are more <laughs> uh, London Park City says Rob yes Wonderful, thank you. Um, then we have a few others. So we have another question from Mavi asking, how do you stop folks from using public gardens as gathering, drinking slash smoking locations where litter is left behind, where there's probably around benches in the public woods? Is anyone uh, able to talk about this uh, sort of issue? Uh, Rob, was that you? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's a challenge because you, so you either do it top down um and you just take out the benches um and you go you're not allowed to culminate there um or you empower people to change you're always always um i think the biggest thing that people think like design or how you do things is going to solve everything it's not we're still human beings um we still get ill we still go oh i don't really want to do that we still want to have lions why because we're human um we don't really want people telling us off and doing things however if we see the impacts of our actions so if we go look if you're leaving litter it can increase this and this and this um so I think it's how you look at positive change. A really good example of how people have done that is if you look at the Helen Hamlin Centre um, at the Royal College of Art, they're incl an inclusive design um, research group attached to the RCA. Um, they deal with a number of projects like this all the time. We've worked with them, I've worked with them. Um, and so I think it's a bit more complicated than just going we're going to put up signs or we're going to change things i think it's about how you open a dialogue to go actually how do we completely transform the space so that it is good or interesting or safe um in different times of day or night again if there's legal parameters it's very difficult talking to a screen about something i don't know the context of it's not how we just start a design project um but so yeah, I think I think it's it's we don't need just the stick or the carrot. It's about actually how how are things working? What's the dynamic within those spaces? What how do we give people agency to be able to do that? I think that's really important. Yeah, some really great points there. And Taishan, did you want to add to that? Yeah, just to extend on what Rob was saying, I think as part of what I was saying previously as well, if you if you co-design a space and you get the community on board right at the beginning of that design process, then you'll automatically find, I think there's some some pictures of the Morley College project. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't attach um, pictures from before, but if you saw the state it, it was in before, you could clearly see that people had left rubbish everywhere. It was quite neglected and wasn't well looked after. But now it's a space where, uh, you know, people going out to have meetings, to have lunch, um, to have smoke break, um, you know, there's all different reasons why people are now engaging with that space and it becomes very self self policing. Um, and I think if you have people from all different ages and all different backgrounds, especially in that space there, I think in terms of leaving that legacy and people understanding the process behind the space and understanding why that space has been created in a way it has. And it might be a, a friend that then says to another friend or, you know, a father to a son, look, I was part of that 
that project. And all of, all of a sudden, there's accountability. There's some sort of respect, mutual respect across the people that are engaging in that space. And so that's why I'm really keen to explore the kind of co-design initiatives that, um, you know, especially in public residential spaces. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Harriet? Oh, you're on mute, Harriet. <laughs> I went to unmute myself at the wrong time, so I really uh, thought I was getting away with it, last minute. Um, so the, yeah, the other thing I wanted to add on to that as well is, so if it's more, I mean, you can still involve community and really important at any stage, but if it's a more established space, then also showing the value of what, what is there, a bit like Rob was saying, like in the wildlife garden, we've recorded over 3,300 species and it's a tiny space. And that's the kind of fact that people are like, Whoa, okay, like, because we've also had visitors go, well, where is the nature in the nature garden? Because people tend to be quite plant blind and they don't look closely for tiny insects. So just sort of showcasing, actually, this is what's here. This is why it's important to species, to the area, to different things. But also might not be what people want to hear. Or, But if a space is being used, it's being used and, yeah, providing bins and actually looking at, speaking to the people who are using it and what are they using it for and kind of positively engaging and making sure that it isn't about the grass gets muddied because people are using it too much. It's about, right, how do we encourage people to use it and make it work for them and maintain it so that it can keep being used? Wonderful. Thanks so much. And as we're coming towards the kind of near the end of our time, um, I'd like to kind of give a final question to you all. So when it comes to kind of supporting not only your local environment, but kind of the environment as a whole. And getting involved in making change can feel like a quite a big task. So what would you say to those watching who want to get involved, but don't know what, to, how or where to start? Um, Rob, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. Um, so we are, I'm very honoured and very lucky to be part of the My Nature Watch team. Um, it, like I said, it's, it's interinstitutional, but we're working with um, the wildlife trusts and taking part in um, 30 Days Wild, which is an amazing um, campaign and series of activities that happens throughout June. Um, so please just look up 30 Days Wild, order a pack. Um, it's it's building links between you know um, care homes and schools. It's building links between offices. And again, a lot of these activities, it would be great if you make a camera, try and make a camera, but you don't have to. It, some of the activities within it are just um, literally right. How can you enjoy um, a moment? How can you identify birdsong? It's some of it's really really accessible and um it's an absolute amazing result so yeah check out the my nature watch project and have a look at 30 days wild if you get a chance thank you great thanks so much uh tayshan doing you next yeah i think uh one thing I, i'm really keen to normalize is just people getting involved and just having a go i think you know a garden uh can be anywhere it could be a windowsill it can be a balcony it can be a park it can be anywhere um so i think it's it's kind of relative to the person and the situation so um, I think, you know, I'd love to bring down those barriers through what we're doing at Grow to Know. Um, and yeah, that, you can follow us on, on Twitter, Instagram, uh, and any of those platforms, any social media platform to kind of follow our, our progress and get involved uh, in any projects that we're doing. Amazing. And Harriet, what are your final words to our audience? Uh, starting somewhere is yeah always the way to go and it's a really nice way of alleviating anxiety doing volunteering or gardening or creating habitat spaces something to put in something positive there's loads of like open days and events and like walks that community gardens and spaces put on that's often a really good way to just test it out and meet and see learn a few things speak to some people um, I also really like an app called iNaturalist where you can identify things through taking a photo and you can also, um, yeah, monitor them and it is a database that scientists use and it's kind of a nice purpose to going outside. <clears throat> and, yeah, go jauntly walks are also quite exciting, I think. Lovely. Thanks so much.
Unfortunately, that brings us to the end of this lunchtime discussion. Thanks so much to Rob, Harry, and Taishan for joining us today. For those watching live on YouTube, apologies if we were unable to get to your questions or read out your thoughts. A recording of this discussion will soon appear on the Great Exhibition Road Festival YouTube channel for you to watch again or share with your friends or colleagues whenever you want. All future live events and recorded video from the festival will be appearing on this new YouTube channel. So do follow us and you'll get a little notification when a new live event or recorded video has been posted. We have a link soon to be posted in the YouTube chat to an evaluation form where you can tell us what you thought of this event. We'd really appreciate your feedback. Otherwise, that's it from me. Thank you to everyone who tuned in and have a great afternoon.